Thomas, you want to give it a couple of minutes for more people to show up and then go ahead and get started? Um, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Looks like we still got some folks trickling in. Let me know whenever you're ready, Mike. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, we can go ahead and just get started here. Um, I guess every to everybody who is currently here, um, uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. We're excited to talk to you about our our, our chip cytometry platform and our new Cellscape instrument. Um, if you could, there is two ways we can we can take questions. You can either um, type them into the chat. Um, on that little control panel, um, or you can uh, select to raise your hand, and um, uh, we'll go ahead at the end of the the presentation here. We'll answer those questions that you chat, or if you have your hand raised, um, I can unmute you to ask the question. Um, so without further ado, I, I'll hand this over to Thomas Campbell, our product manager uh, for the for the chip cytometry platform. Um, thanks again for taking the time to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. Mike, can you see my slides or do you see the presenter view? Yep, I can I can see those slides just fine. Okay, great. Keep muting me, Mike. <laughs> oh, <laughs> keep clicking uh, on the wrong. Yes. Uh thanks thanks everyone for joining. Uh my name is Thomas Campbell, uh product manager for the chip cytometry platform uh here at Canopy Biosciences. Um, and excited to have the opportunity today to to tell you a little bit about this platform. Um, it's a it's an image based platform which uh, uses uh, typically uh, primary fluorescently labeled antibodies to uh, perform a really high plex uh, single cell uh, spatial profiling um, within tissue samples. And so I'll start by sort of uh, talking about how it works at a high level uh, to start, and then I'll drill down into the details of of uh, the, the new uh, Cellscape instrument, which we've launched just a couple months ago, and we're really excited about. So at a really high level, and I think you guys are kind of coming at this from, from a flow cytometry-like background. Um, so really what we're doing here is we're using uh, flow cytometry-like uh, antibodies and getting flow cytometry-like data um, out, of a, out of a tissue sample. And we do this uh, by first staining the sample uh, with a, a series of different fluorescently labeled antibodies and taking a series of different fluorescence images. <clears throat> and then we analyze the image data first by performing cell segmentation. Um, so there's an algorithm that draws a border around each individual cell in the sample and then measures the fluorescence intensity uh, kind of within that defined cellular border for each marker in the assay. And then we can cast those fluorescence intensity values on a cell by cell basis into a dot plot format, just like you might be familiar with from flow cytometry. And then we can kind of go through the process of hierarchical, you know, bivariate gating uh, to phenotype different cell populations of interest and, and quantify those different populations. And then once we've identified and quantified um, those different phenotypes of interest, of course, we can go back to the image data and see where those different cell types are, are spatially distributed. Uh, within the sample. 
And kind of uh, one one layer deeper here uh, in terms of uh, how we how this the workflow actually works and and uh, how we achieve the high plex assays in particular. Um, the one of the pillars of the technology is the sample chip itself. That's why we call it chip cytometry. And these are little microfluidic devices that are the size of a standard microscope slide. And you load your sample onto the microfluidic chip, and then through the microfluidics we can iteratively deliver reagents to the sample, and in most cases, uh, antibodies and various buffers. And so you'll stain with a cocktail of up to five, uh, five antibodies, you know, uh, each, each antibody specific for a different uh, target of interest, and each one uh, conjugated to a different fluorophore. And then we collect image data on those five markers and then photobleach away the fluorescent signal. And then through the fluidics, again, we can do this over and over and over again, uh, to sort of iteratively build up really high plex assays. And then there's a lot of downstream image processing, overlaying all these images that were collected from subsequent cycles, uh, which is really well automated uh, uh, with, within the software there. Uh, we can do this with, uh, with tissue samples as well as cell suspensions like PBMCs. Um, and I'd be happy to kind of talk about, talk about the differences there uh, most of what I focus on here is on tissue samples because that's where kind of, there's kind of the biggest differentiation, um, especially relative to flow cytometry. But you can do cell suspensions also. The data that you're going to get out of that is just like what you would get from flow cytometry. The advantages being uh, mainly, uh, you know, you can build up really, really high plex assays, um, but more importantly, you can kind of uh, uh, start and stop this iterative process. Um, at, as many times as you'd like over the course of, uh, of more than two years. So you can stain with a, uh, you know, an assay of 15 or 20 markers today. Uh, you can put your sample in the fridge and pull it back out at some, some later point in time and sort of pick up right where you left off and, and re-interrogate that sample with, with an additional set of markers. And I say, at least when we're talking about cell suspension samples, you know, PBMCs and, and other samples like that, this is really the main differentiator uh, relative to flow cytometry. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, the, the majority of what we'll kind of talk about today is uh, is the ability to uh, analyze tissue samples and, and where the real advantage relative to flow cytometry is, you know, obviously uh, the preservation of that spatial information and the, the contextual information within the, the sample, the tissue sample itself. Um, so the endpoint here is really, you know, being able to uh, stain many, many markers on the same sample. We can iteratively multiplex uh, dozens and dozens of markers, virtually unlimited number of markers on the same sample. Uh, and then from there, we can phenotype, uh, you know, um, quantify and phenotype every individual cell in the sample. So we can, we know quantitatively the expression for each marker in the assay. For each individual cell in the sample and if you just take this example here you know we know that this cell uh, labeled a is an nkt cell based on the expression of these markers and so on and so forth for for every individual cell in the sample um, you may be familiar with uh, uh, some types of um, uh, spatial biology platforms out there that are uh, collecting similar types of data sets but one of the things that really makes chip cytometry unique is that we're doing all of this uh, with just standard fluorescently labeled uh, antibodies, which you can source from a variety of different commercial vendors. Um, and, and, and this means that you can leverage, you know, if you guys are coming at this from a, from a flow cytometry background, you likely have a whole library of antibodies um, that you're very familiar with in your lab. And uh, you can leverage that, that expertise and that experience with, with specific clones. Um, and you don't have to be tied to some sort of a specific um, you know, antibody conjugation scheme, which is pretty common in, uh, in this field in particular. Um, what this does, this sort of open source nature, uh, this open source approach to, to antibody chemistry really unlocks a broad range of applications. You know, um, antibodies have been used for, for quite a while to detect various things, and, and we're able to kind of leverage that, uh, that um, breadth of experience in the field. Um, in our hands, we validated over 250 different biomarkers across a range of different applications, oncology, immunology, neuroscience, infectious disease, um, uh, as well as across a, a wide range of different sample uh, types, different species. So uh, we've got panels for human, uh, non-human primate, and, and uh, mouse and rat panels as well. 
Um, but actually where this becomes uh, really advantageous is, you, you know, using open source antibodies is helpful for, for a broad range of applications, but it's also really important when you start talking about very specific applications. Um, most of our customers are kind of looking at, at, at a range of kind of core immune markers, uh, but then they also kind of typically want to tack on one or two markers that are very specific to their particular research question or their, their line of research. Um, one example here, just to illustrate that point, is this, uh, um, this paper that was published by a user group out of the University of Oxford where they use the chip cytometry platform to identify and characterize these rare T cell subsets known as mate cells. And you can see they have a couple of, uh, you know, pretty standard immune markers there, CD3 and CD8, uh, but then also a couple more, uh, I'd say esoteric markers, uh, B alpha 7.2 and PLZF, which are, you know, very specific to characterizing this, this rare T cell subset. And you could imagine that if they were utilizing a, a platform that required some sort of proprietary antibody conjugation scheme, you know, finding um, uh, clones for for, uh, for markers like the alpha 7.2 or PLZF uh, would be a, a lot more laborious. You have to find a clone, uh, most likely perform uh, the conjugation yourself and go through the purification um, and then sort of re revalidate or reassess that clone's performance at, at that point. Uh, whereas with chip cytometry, since we're just using standard fluorescently labeled antibodies, which could be sourced from, from a variety of different commercial vendors, uh, in this case, they were able to, uh, to get those off the shelf and, uh, and get their assay up and running with, uh, with a lot more ease. And so the emphasis here, I think it really is that, uh, you know, chip cytometry isn't tied to any particular um, antibody chemistry. Uh, which, which is a, a real advantage and, and gives users a, a lot of flexibility um, when it comes to assay design. And, and, and uh, to kind of further that point a little bit more, um, this is a, a brand new paper which was published by one of our users uh, who actually, you know, was using chip cytometry to um, identify and characterize uh, protein targets, but also combined that with uh, with RNA targets and um, and use the RNA scope reagents from ACG Bio um, in conjunction with standard fluorescently labeled antibodies um, to look at both uh, protein and uh, mRNA targets on the exact same sample. Um, so this really emphasizes the point that um, what chip cytometry is about is providing a, a platform to do these really high plex assays and providing a hardware to to collect these image data. Uh, in a way that's really uh, precise and optimized for uh, for doing these types of uh, measurements and these types of experiments, um, but it's not any particular um, uh, chemistry that uh, that that users need to need to use. Okay, so I'll kind of shift gears here from there. That that's sort of like kind of kind of the main introduction of how chip cytometry works. And uh, with the next uh, uh, section of slides here, I'll talk more about our new Cellscape instrument. Um, and this is something we're, we're really excited to bring to the market, something we've been uh, developing for, for a long time and is sort of our second generation chip cytometry instrument. And um, we've, been, we've been selling into this sort of spatial allergy market for, for a long time. And uh, with the, the design of the, of the Cellscape instrument, um, we've really sort of uh, um, uh, integrated a, a lot of feedback from, from our existing customers. And what we've heard and I think that this is true across the spatial biology market, is that regardless of sort of, uh, of, of the development phase that, that your research uh, sits in, all the way from you know, really early discovery phase up to uh, more you know, broad scale, um, uh, like, like clinical type applications, um, the throughput of these types of systems has, has really been a hindrance of, of um, uh, large scale adoption. And so that's one of the main things that we've sought to address with the design of, uh, of the Cellscape instrument. So um, this is the, the Cellscape instrument, the next generation chip cytometry instrument, which is um, an enclosed imaging system, which is purpose-built and, and really highly optimized for uh, doing exactly these types of you know, high throughput, high plex spatial omics experiments. Um, this uh, imaging system integrates with a, uh, an automated liquid handling um, a fluidics unit which then integrates with a, a four gang sample holder on, on the imaging system itself. Um, so you can load in four samples and perform all of the staining and image, imaging and data acquisition uh, for four complete samples without any 
um, inter user intervention uh, uh, on the system there. And so what I'll talk about uh, here with the next few slides is how we've taken, uh, you know, made, made some really significant advances to the chip cytometry platform as it relates to uh, throughput and in, uh, in automation. And as we've sort of built this imaging system from the ground up uh, for this particular application, we've made some optimizations there uh, to really improve uh, the optical performance. Um, but we've combined all this with sort of uh, the same core benefits that our existing chip cytometry users are familiar with. Um, so that's the, the high-plex uh, spatial omics I've already sort of talked about. Um, high resolution and HDR imaging, these are two points that we'll talk about here in a couple of slides. Um, we're you know, holding on to this, uh, this open source um, uh, antibody piece, which is a really important piece to a lot of our, our existing customers. And then also the ability to, to store and re-interrogate samples, as I've already touched on. Uh, the main thing being throughput, and one of the one of the primary ways that we've uh, made a really dramatic input uh, increase to to the throughput of the system uh, relative to the uh, previous generation of the instrument is through uh, uh, optimization of the optical train, which has allowed us to uh, dramatically increase the size of the field of view. Um, so this is the area with which we can collect data on with a single image. Um, and so with, with some improvements there, we've more than doubled the field of view. So that means we can uh, collect data on more than double the number of cells um, in, in the same amount of time. And one of the things that that does is it makes it practical to, to scan uh, and analyze larger tissue sections. Um, so here's a photograph of kind of the of, of two different chips, uh, kind of the first generation chip here uh, on the bottom and then the, the next generation chip here on the top. And you can see these dimensions that I've uh, overlaid here. Um, this area in the center is the area where the, the tissue uh, specimen sits. And so that's you know kind of the area where the imaging is done. And you can see we've increased this by more than 50% um uh so that you can you can scan and and analyze larger tissue sections um in microscopy there's sort of uh, traditionally this trade-off between throughput and resolution so uh, you might expect that with a dramatic increase in throughput we may maybe may needed to make some um uh, some you know trade-offs with with resolution but uh in, in fact uh, that's not the case. We've actually made some nice improvements to resolution. This image here um, short of, sort of shows you uh, the range of resolution values that we see uh, in the spatial biology market. So over here uh, on the order of 10,000 nanometers per pixel, you know, you're getting good spatial information, um, uh, but with kind of multicellular resolution. And this is representative of something like uh, uh, the nanostring geomics platform, if you're familiar with that. Um, kind of moving to the left then at about a thousand nanometers per pixel. This is more, um, uh, this is kind of where most of the mass spec based approaches are sitting. And then with a lot of the image based approaches, we're at about 500 nanometers per pixel. This is where we were with the previous generation of the chip cytometry instrument. And uh, now with, with Cellscape, we've made some really dramatic improvements here, and we're now able to collect images with resolution of 800 and, uh, 182 nanometers per pixel, uh, which gives us you know, fantastic acuity here to be able to, uh, to take really uh, high quality images, and uh, which has a big impact kind of downstream, uh, being able to perform accurate cell segmentation and, and so on. Um, we also have a, a, an available um, Falcon fast mode, which further increases the, the field of view for, for a given image so that we're collecting data at more than eight times faster uh, um, compared to the previous generation of the Cellscape instrument, uh, which as you can imagine, you know, this makes it uh, really practical to perform rapid analysis of, of whole tissue sections again, while maintaining this sort of best in class optical resolution, which allows us to accurately uh, detect and quantify uh, expression on a single cell basis. Uh, we've combined this really uh, uh, high throughput and high resolution imaging with uh, our proprietary uh, high dynamic range image acquisition pipeline. This was a feature of the original uh, chip cytometry instrument, but uh, is also present with the, the Cellscape instrument. And what we're doing here is we're generating images that have a, a broader dynamic range than, than typical uh, fluorescent microscopy images. And we do this by actually taking the same image uh, multiple times using multiple different exposure times. 
so that we can collect uh, the really bright signals using short exposure times and then the really dim, ex dim signals using really long exposure times. And then we take all those kind of multi-exposure images and fuse them together into one composite image that has brighter bright values and darker dark values and sort of more shades in between. And you can sort of qualitatively see that difference here. We've got a high dynamic range image on the left, which is nice and crisp and has uh, bright brights and really dark darks. Um, and then you can compare that to kind of a standard dynamic range image here, which definitely lacks um, uh, some definition and you have some areas that are, that are really blown out. But we can't truly um, uh, appreciate these differences just by uh, looking at these two images because our eyes can't see a full eight logs of dynamic range and also the uh, the computer monitor uh, or the screen that you're looking at can't display um, this many values. So another way to, to display this just to illustrate the point a little bit further um, is to maybe maybe take a similar image and display it with a, a gradient display and you can see uh, as is the case with with uh, with all samples we have really high expressing regions you have some really low expressing regions and then you have kind of the majority of the sample has some sort of, uh, of moderate expression there. And we know that actually it's impossible with, uh, with the current state of camera technology to, uh, to capture all of these values, the really high expressing values and the low expressing values um, uh, accurately with a single exposure. And we know that because if we look at the range of expression values that we see in biology, we know it's on, on the order of uh, six logs. This is just an example here, looking at interferon gamma expression in T cells. You can see just by looking at the axis, we're, we're on the order of six logs here. Uh, and there's no spatially resolved detector. There's no camera on the market that can capture this range of values uh, with a single exposure. So what ends up happening typically is you have to, you have to pick some exposure. Most of the time you're gonna pick something that's sort of best for the majority of the sample. Um, most of that moderate expression here in the middle, uh, but then kind of all of the expression uh, above or below that dynamic range cutoff is is going to be chopped, and so you're going to you're going to miss out on on that information. Um, and I think the emphasis here is that you know you, you may not be able to necessarily tell the difference um, between a, a standard dynamic range and a high dynamic range image um, just by looking at them, but when you try to take uh, these images and um, extract quantitative information out of it and do you know, downstream analysis, you can really see how um, dynamic range starts to kind of uh, uh, rear its ugly head. And uh, to illustrate that point here, here's sort of a post-process you know, quantitative uh, data which, which has been extracted from the images. Uh, we've got chip cytometry, uh, HDR image data on the left, and you can see this double positive cytotoxic CD8 T cell population, which exists out here on the order three or four logs of, of dynamic range um, and compare that to, to a similar, um, uh, similar data set collected on a, a similar type of platform that uses just standard dynamic range imaging. Um, and just by looking at the axes, you can see that the, the dynamic range of the data set is much more limited. And in fact, once you get out here beyond about, uh, about 100 or so, you, you uh, complete, you know, it's complete noise and you lose the ability to, uh, to detect this uh, cytotoxic CD8 T cell population, which uh, of course may be of interest um, uh, for for your analysis. So the the point is that you know the the upstream kind of image quality has a has a big implication on the downstream data quality when you try to extract quantitative information um, from the images, and that's really one of the one of the pillars of the chip cytometry platform of uh, making sure that we're collecting the images. Uh, in the, the most precise and um, in accurate way so that when we go to do the post-processing, um, we get accurate uh, quantitative information out of that. Um, to give you just a sense of the, the types of questions that our customers may be asking, um, you know, with this type of platform, uh, in, with this example here, uh, we had actually two biopsies from the same patient. Um, this is a patient with tendon neck squamous cell carcinoma, and we had a biopsy of the primary tumor site as well as a biopsy of the metastatic site. And we're able to quantify a, a range of different um, immune cell types and look for differences, which you could see um, there were pretty significant differences, especially as it relates to, uh, to T cell infiltration, which was much higher in the primary tumor, um, you know, sort of getting at the, the immunogenicity of, of this particular tumor sample. And uh, you can imagine making these types of A-B comparisons, whether it's uh, two tumors, uh, within the same patient, you know, primary versus metastatic or 
or maybe it's uh, treated versus untreated from, from two different patient groups, or uh, maybe it's multiple uh, time points across you know, a patient's treatment journey. Um, we can also make these types of comparisons within the same sample. Um, so, uh, you know, trying to understand tumor heterogeneity, you can see in this uh, colorectal cancer sample here on the left, um, that just qualitatively there's some, there's some really significant heterogeneity and we can uh, analyze these regions of interest separately. So we have sort of this uh, immune high region and we can compare that to relatively immune low region, um, quantify all these different immune cell subsets uh, within the two regions of interest and see really significant differences as it relates to the uh, abundances of, of key uh, uh, phenotypic populations. Um, so I know I've gone through this uh, relatively quickly. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time to, uh, to address any questions you guys might have, but just to sort of um, to summarize the platform here, uh, you know, what chip cytometry is all about is, uh, uh, you know, not being tied to any particular chemistry, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a hardware, it's a platform which is optimized for making these types of, uh, you know, collecting these types of data for, you know, differentiated performance. Um, in order to do this and uh, these types of experiments and be truly quantitative, you know, first you have to have uh, the resolution and the acuity to, to see every cell and differentiate one cell uh, from another. You have to have the dynamic range uh, capable of detecting the full range of expression values we see in biology, and then you've got to have nice, uh, um, you know, nice software to be able to to accurately perform these types of analyses, um, and and you know treat these, um, uh, you know, have quantitative linear treatment of all all these signals. And so this is sort of what chip cytometry is all about: is is collecting data. Uh, collecting images in the in the most accurate way possible for for doing this uh, these types of measurements specifically. And again, uh, as I mentioned, that you know we've been um, selling the chip cytometry platform for for a number of years now, and uh, this cellscape instrument sort of the second generation, uh, and it's it's really sort of the the manifestation of of a lot of feedback from from customers in the market, and I think we've done a good job of addressing customers' needs, um, both existing chip cytometry customers and, and people coming from other platforms who, you know, they said they wanted a, a platform that's a lot faster than, than existing platforms, um, something with walk-away automation and, and minimal hands-on time. And, uh, you know, they want this speed and, and automation without any um, sacrifice in terms of image quality or data quality. Um, and then, of course, we've kind of wrapped this all into, into one uh, nice box that, that uh, also leverages kind of the open source uh, nature that, that we've talked about already. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I have, just a pretty quick introduction to the platform. And I'd love with the remaining time to, to field any questions you guys might have. Yeah, so if you guys have any questions, please, you know, type them into the question prompt. Um, otherwise, you, there's a way to raise your hand um the little icon there and and i can unmute you and you can ask your question um so so far we have one question from andrea asking um so you would you expect to the same panel of antibodies that we use for our aurora cytometry to work with canopy the the cellscape yeah um so i mean i think it it depends on um the specific sample types and things like that, but I think you know likely you're going to need to do some tweaking to um, you know dilutions and incubation times and things like that without knowing the specifics of kind of what's what sample types you're talking about. Um, but yeah, in many cases we can we can leverage, uh, and I think we have customers using using the Aurora system in particular and kind of coming over from that. Um, but yeah, in many cases you can you can leverage your experience with those particular clones. Uh, and and the antibody, uh, um, sorry, the um, fluorophore conjugates as well. Okay. I guess we'll wait to see if there's uh, any more questions that come through in the next couple of minutes. Okay, um, another question. How much time does it take the whole staining and acquisition image acquisition process? Yeah, so you know, there's a there's a couple of uh, main variables variables that impact this uh, when we talk about like throughput on a per sample basis. 
Um, the, the two main ones being the number of markers in a panel and the area scan. So because we're, you know, we're doing this iteratively, you know, five plex at a time, uh, the more markers you add in the assay, the, the longer it's going to take. Um, and, and then we're kind of uh, collecting these images position by position. So the larger the area you want to uh, analyze, the, the more time it's going to take. So that said, um, uh, I can give you an example around sort of a pretty typical experiment, which in most cases our customers are looking at something between like 15 and 30 markers, you know, around 20 or so markers, um, and maybe up to about 10 square millimeters. And for that, we can we can do about eight samples per day um, with our kind of standard configuration. And then with the, the Falcon fast mode, you you would quadruple that. So you're topping out at uh, maybe around 30 or 32 samples per day. Um, which, yeah, I mean, depending on depending on your perspective, um, if you're coming at this from from flow cytometry, uh, you know, maybe in many cases that may ha may have higher throughput. Uh, or if you're coming at this from like a, a pathology background and uh, you're used to these like high throughput uh, IHC slide scanners that that may not sound super fast, uh, but relative to uh, kind of uh, other available really high plex, um, you know, spatial omics platforms, uh, th this is pretty blazing fast. We'll just uh, wait a couple minutes here, see if there's any other questions. All right, any other questions from anybody? And definitely, uh, you know, we can we can share the recording uh, after this, and and if you yep. guys have any other questions that that come up uh, afterwards, of course, we'd be be happy to address those either uh, over email or or if you need a follow up call, we're happy to do that as well. All right, great. Um, well, I want to to thank you everybody for attending, and thank you to for David for helping uh, coordinate this. Um, if you have any questions or need to follow up, you can either or go through David, or um, you can. Um, of course, go through me or Thomas as well. So um, thank you very much for your time. Um, and we look forward to uh, getting feedback from you in the future.